Afternoon, everyone. Can people hear at the back? You can hear me? Can you hear me? Faint. Faint, is it? Okay. Person in the back is a bit faint. Okay. Is that better? Yes. Wonderful. Okay. Um, good to see you all here this afternoon. This particular session, we're going to embark on subjects that are, are, can be quite detailed, so we'll do our best to explain them as simply as we can. There are also going to be things that we're presenting today that you may need to process a little bit, so it's okay just to park them or just keep with it. And their teachings are very fundamental to the Buddhist practice. So before we start, we're going to do a meditation. And those that were here last week will know that we have two types of meditations. The first is single point of concentration, where you rest the body, you rest the mind, resting the mind, allows the body to rest and then we bring our concentration into one point so we gather the mind and it's all activities into that one point to develop or to rewire the brain so our concentration improves it also is a very good way to be in a state of mind where you can think practically, logically, you can see things that perhaps others are not aware of, and you're just very grounded and present. So it's just going to be a single point of concentration, meditation, with perhaps a little bit of analytical. Analytical is about exploring a subject, a feeling, a behaviour, a teaching that you learn and then experience that from that learning in there. So find yourself in a comfortable position where your back is straight. And if you need to move, you can. Keeping the back straight will allow the energies to flow freely within your body. And if you're not well and watching this at home, you could be lying on the floor. Just feel your body settling. Start with the body, you feel that your forehead is relaxed. And going down to the eyes. Have a sense of how the eyes are. And allow them, allow them to go soft, relaxed. Facial muscles, back of the neck, down the shoulders. arms, hands, left hand, right hand, working together to allow your body to rest in its natural state, the back, the legs, knees, ankles and feet. Allow the energy still 
to flow freely within the body. As we now gather the mind, gather the mind to a point of the breath. Where, where is the breath? Where do you notice it the most? Just find that place. Tip of the nostrils or back of the throat. Or simply the rising and falling of the breath itself within the body. Find that place and gather the mind there. Notice the breath. You may even notice now that your breathing has changed. And if there are any thoughts floating in the space of your mind, they're just thoughts at the moment. Distractions. So bring your mind back to the breathing. Back to you. naturally be without restriction. And now with the breath, imagine the breath filling every cell in our body. Breath can Go vertically up to the crown, back down, or from the breath itself, expanding out within the body itself. moving to the breath and now taking the mind off the breath focus on light within you a brilliant light within your heart A white light 
just there, always there, a clear light. And it's a natural color. So imagine the light now intensifying, soothing, calming, extending out wide within your own body and every cell in your body. And you are aware of where the light is within and around you. A light that purifies thoughts. A light that purifies sound. A light that purifies speech. A light that purifies movement. A light that purifies the space around you. A light that purifies taste. And all your movements are elegant, calm, thoughtful. and timely. And all your words are kind, compassion, patience. And working with the sounds and what you hear. You hear sounds, but beneath the sounds are meanings. And you hear the meanings. A light that purifies sight with sound. A sight that sees everything from the smallest blade of grass to the entire landscape of mountains, trees, lakes, snow, sky, sound, all at once. And yet, here you are. In this present moment, a moment in time, 
folding images in stillness and calmness. Your mind is clear and knowing. So now bring the mind, mind back to the breath. The breath, a part of you always. and sense the rising and falling of the breath. Feel when you're breathing in and breathing out. You become aware of this space, temple, the cushion or chair you're sitting on, the gentle tone of light through your closed eyes, and sounds in the temple. So when you are ready, you may gently open your eyes. So towards the end of today's session, we're going to do a, an authentic, a original Buddhist meditation that will require both single point of concentration and analytical concentration. And it's such a powerful meditation. It purifies negative karma. It also generates a lot of merit. So we'll make the time to do it and just on about 20 to 3. So before you enter the path to enlightenment, before you consider the, the different subjects or going to the 4 o'clock class, one of the things in that the Buddhists or the Buddhists believe is rebirth. So most religion doctrines assert that there's some form of some form of continuity of consciousness, and in some uh, religious streams, they believe that there is that that um, stream of consciousness, but there's only one rebirth, and in that one rebirth, depending on what you or how you've lived your life, you either are reborn into hell or you're reborn into heaven. So there's the continuities of consciousness. But Buddhists assert that continuity of lifetimes with many possibilities of rebirth, and it's not internal. So yes, we believe in uh, reincarnation, rebirth, and it's continuous. So wherever you are, what kind of rebirth that you've had, it's temporary. So you're born again. So consider something like someone who's rich. It's a, a good scenario to look at. Someone who's fairly rich and famous and extremely happy. They're totally oblivious to, to anything else but their wealth, their friends, their own happiness, and they are truly happy. I think we all know people like that who... who who say, I'm happy, but nothing to worry about. And they're successful. And this, in this scenario here, we'll have someone who is very wealthy. But in the process of generating, we'll say, his, uh, his wealth, he treated people very badly. He harmed people. He also made his wealth his primary focus, 
and didn't care for others that may be suffering. His main area of interest was his own pleasures and his immediate family. But never had any regards to, to the people that worked for him that made the business successful. So because of that, because of the fact that he's harming people, he's generating negative karma. The fact that this person's wealthy means that they've generated positive karma from past lifetimes and therefore it's ripened in this lifetime to be extremely rich and wealthy and popular. But in this lifetime, he keeps the money for himself and he doesn't help those that are less fortunate. And he's not doing anything to create more causes for the condition of being rich in the next life. So he ages, he gets sick, and he dies. He dies without any, any knowledge of his wealth. And because of the negative karma that he's generated, He's reborn as a beggar in poverty, in sickness, with no influence whatsoever. So this is the second core, which is the second noble truth, that in our suffering, there are causes of that suffering. And Last week we looked at the Four Noble Truths as it was possible in one lifetime. But the Four Noble Truths cover many lifetimes. So we know that they're suffering. And in this life, this person has created the causes for that suffering unknowingly and missed the Third and Fourth Noble Truth. So die and get reborn back into, into the suffering again. And furthermore, people who are not aware of the Dharma and rebirth and the causes and anything about the Four Noble Truths continue to cycle one birth after another and miss sometimes the most important teachings they could have taught them, yes, you can still be happy, you can still enjoy everything that you've got, your friends, your family, your relationships, your job, but there's a way to do it that maintains that, that sustains that in this life and in future life. Once you embody that there is a thing called rebirth within you, then there's a shift. I grew up in a Catholic family, but I was lucky to have a father who just believed in reincarnation. It's a bit confusing, but he, he absolutely stood by it. And being a scholar himself, he explained and taught stories on where that was removed from the most important Christian teachings. So I grew up with the thought and knowledge that we are going to be reborn. For some, it may take a while, so just sit with it and view the, the world around you and what you think happens. So in not being exposed to the Dharma, this person wouldn't have heard the most profoundest of sayings from Shantideva, which was, whatever joy there is in this world all comes from desiring others to be happy. And whatever suffering there is in this world or comes from desiring myself to be happy. So when Shanti Davis said that, so whatever suffering is in this world, it's in context to our streams of lifetime. There is a reason why people are not happy. There is a reason why people are happy. Either way, whether we're happy or whether we're unhappy, there are causes to maintain that happiness and reduce the unhappiness and build up merit 
for positivity and happiness in this life and in future life. So we'll just follow the beggar, just so I'll follow the story of the beggar. So just say in the last year of his life, as many lives as a beggar, he develops hum humility and compassion for other poor beggars. And so he gives them whatever food that he that he can. So he's, he's this these years of being in suffering and it's sort of sort of made him soften him a little bit. So he gives his food away. That one act of helping somebody, that very single act, can produce such merit that it can propel him into the a rebirth into rich parents. However, if he continues his cycle of harming others and unethical behaviour or non-virtuous behaviour and making his money the wealth, where does he go? Back into a rebirth of poverty, perhaps even as a, as, as a um, working in a sweatshop with a very bad complaining boss. We just don't know. These are the causes. These are the results the Buddha taught. If you wish to have more happiness in your life, this is how you do it. If you wish to have more patience, this is the method. If you don't have patience, these are the antidotes to developing patience. So that's essential. Rebirth is extremely essential to understand the framework of the Buddhist teachings. And only by our body and mind, or whilst our body and our mind remain conditioned with non-virtuous behaviours, delusions and karmas, we will continue the cycle an uncontrollable cycle through endless streams of higher and lower rebirths. So if you can just imagine all our lives like a basket, an old ancient basket without handles, and all our lives being red beads, yellow beads, different types of beads in this basket, this huge basket. Every cycle of life is like tossing the beads up in the basket and seeing them fall the bead at the top is now the bead at the bottom. The bead on the left is now the bead on the right. The one, the beads that were in the middle, they're now somewhere left or right. Or, and that's how our lives are. That's the uncontrollable rebirth. But as we toss the basket up, and some who come and hear and expose to the Dharma teachings, and we toss the beads up, we notice that one bead hasn't come down. It's interesting. And then it gently comes down, down, like a beautiful, clear orb, and there's the enlightened person, or the person that's attained liberation. And they've come down into the basket to teach others. That's simple. But it takes effort. And that's how we can break the cycle of the continuous lives. So this lifetime is dependent for its very existence on previous and future lives. Continuity of mind, therefore, is fundamental to the concept of rebirth. So there are four seals in the, in the Dharma, or the Mahayana Buddhism, which says all products are impermanent all contaminated things are miserable, all phenomena, selfless, nirvana is peace. When we say all contaminated things are miserable, we mean that contamination is caused or miserable through delusions, greed, desire, attachment. And all phenomena are selfless. We're going to look at that a little bit later. Not today, but just some, just a little touch of what selfless means. And nirvana is peace. It's not a rock band. It is nirvana in that filled stillness. And in nirvana, in liberation, you no longer generate any negative karma. 
You no longer react in a way that generates karma for others. You're in this amazing state of calm, peace. You are benefiting others just by your presence. You may even explore the Dharma more profoundly and start to develop bodhicitta, which allows you to attain Buddhahood. So we've achieved this rare and precious human life. So why is it rare? So it's rare because it's called a, a, a perfect human rebirth. There are 7.8 billion humans on this planet, but not all of them follow a spiritual practice. And not all of them are born in, into conditions where they're able to have free time, which is leisure, and good conditions, fortune, to be able to do anything they wish to do. So out of those 7.8 billion people, a lot are living and suffering. So everything that we have in terms of the Buddhist teachings is that leisure is time. We've got the time to practice and meditate and do other activities which will help us, including, including socialising with friends and helping them and enjoying because it's extremely important for you to be happy in what you do. You've earned that happiness through good conditions in past lives, for the merit that you've generated. So if you're driving a beautiful car, enjoy the car. Just be aware that everything is impermanent. So this life, whatever you are enjoying, it's like drawing on your bank account. At some point you need to restock the bank account and what the Buddha's saying is that everything that you are enjoying is impermanent, particularly in this lifetime. So if you wish wealth, you give. Be generous. If you wish to help people, you keep on helping and assisting and learning as much as you can about humanity. So the Buddhists say that we're living a life of leisure and fortune because we have things like eight freedoms from restrictive states. And those eight freedoms from restrictive states are that in this life you've escaped being born from the, in the hell realms. You have the freedom from being born in the spirit realms, animal realms, and godlike realms. And we will look at those realms when we look at um, the 12 licks later in a in the same week four you have a freedom from being born in an irreligious land where there are no teachings at all the freedom from being born where the buddha has not come so the buddha is here we are going to enter what's called the dark eons in which the buddhas do not teach we are fortunate to be born in this light eon during which a thousand buddhas will come to our world and give teachings. You are, have a freedom from any mental deficiency or your um, or faculties, and you have a freedom from holding wrong views. Therefore, you're open to the fact that there is cause and effect. There, you're open to the fact there's a way that you can build merit. You're open to the fact of the Buddha's teachings so the, the Buddha also taught there are other reasons why we've actually had this perfect human rebirth called the Ten Endowments, which are good conditions. So we're, what we're doing now is narrowing and narrowing and narrowing the field from 7.8 billion people. What does it really narrow down to having a precious human rebirth according to the Buddha's teachings, the Ten Endowments? Being born as a human being, of course, you can attain liberation and enlightenment. You can be born in the central land where Dharma teachings are established. Being born with complete sense organs where you're able to listen, think and meditate on the Dharma. 
not having created the five extreme negative karmas. So the fact that you're here right now means that you didn't have not created any uh, ten the negative actions. And congratulations. In past lives too. So being born where the Buddha has appeared, the Buddha or his hearers give Dharma teachings and therefore you have, if you look at this centre, we've got a lot of people who are teachers around the world. We've got highly acclaimed teachers, monks, they, and they have disciples. So some of their disciples have studied with these highly realised lamas for quite some time, and they're called hearers. And hearers are people that hear the Dharma and are able to teach it. They've got this really special skill to do it. And there are followers of the Dharma. And in your life, there are people who have love for others. There are people of a loving nature who care for and support the practitioners, as what we're doing here today for you as well. So if you look at this center, in terms of any Buddhist monastery, and particularly here, given I've been here for just, just on 23 years, that a, t a centre like this relies on volunteers, cooks, people that help clean, the gardening, for example, people that create all the, all the information and, and send out the, the posts that are relevant to these teachings. So everything in here is for you. We're here to support you. And in terms of being born in a place where people have love for others, if you look at Australia, how fortunate is Australia in the way that it accepts all nationalities, all people. And we have such a solid structure in place to protect everyone, to ensure that all virtuous behaviours are offered, are trained, are actually applied at work, applied elsewhere. It is really a wonderful country and just being born here is, and we would have had to accumulate lots of merit to be born here. So, in Buddhism, we also have ways to generate karma for specific things. So, if you wish to have beauty, then one of the ways to produce a beautiful body is to be patient. The causes of a, a very attractive uh, features, and I'm not just speaking about the face, just the whole body's attractive and it's applied, is because you have practiced patience in previous lifetimes. Because if you look at someone who's angry, their face doesn't look very nice, does it? So that constant energy in their body of anger, anger, anger produces a lot, a lot of things, a lot of changes in the body. Neurologically, wiring the brain and also from a cell point of view. And people who are generally angry, other people don't kind of don't want to be around them. They're pleasant, but they don't want to make them in their, include them in their field of, or the circle of friends for that reason there. So there's a lot of downfalls for, for being angry. So you can, you can actually achieve what, what you want in this lifetime. You don't have to give everything up to study Dharma. In fact, the Dharma is that you keep doing, living your life, but changing your mind and your habits to bring more peace to yourself and peace to others. So Chandra Kirti is a, a very, very old scholar from the 17th century, said, when acting freely and living agreeably, if one does not retrain or restrain when falling into the abyss of under the control of others, how will one arise from that in the future? And Shanti Deva also said, now born in the 8th century, having found such leisure, if it, I do not become acquainted with virtue, there is nothing more deceptive than this. There is nothing more foolish than this. So what they're saying is you've achieved this wonderful, wonderful rebirth of leisure and fortune, don't waste it. 
when you look at Chandrakirti from the 7th century and Shantideva from the 8th century, they're saying the same thing, aren't they? They're beating the drum of the Dharma drum to keep reminding all sentient beings how, how and when to practice Dharma. Now this human life can also produce an ultimate value. You can attain liberation and enlightenment and you can get value in every instance. So we've got the capability of attaining liberation, we've got the capability to progress along to attain enlightenment. So every moment counts. Oh, every moment can be made, made meaningful. Working, for example, you might say, and you en might enjoy work very well, you might say, by me practicing patience today and listening to people, may I attain enlightenment to benefit all people, and I do this to benefit others. When you are washing, you may say, may this washing represent me purifying and washing away all my negative actions and allow me to be purified so I can help myself and others attain enlightenment. When going on holidays, you may say, may this, and you don't have to say it all the time, but just, about, just think about it, it's all motivation. May my planning and going on holidays make me calmer, happier, enjoying my friends and understanding how this can help others. And through this, may this merit of understanding help me to attain enlightenment. So it's so no matter what you do, it's important to have that right motivation. So to emphasize the rarity of having a precious re human rebirth with leisure and fortune, there's a, an old Buddhist teaching and you may have already heard about the turtle and the yoke. And the Buddha taught this to his disciples where just consider the, the odds of this happening where an old turtle under the deep ocean, blind, and is swimming. And on top of the vast oceans in this world is an egg yoke somewhere out there somewhere. And this is poor turtle, crippled and blind. And every hundred years it surfaces. It's got the energy to get up and surface. Oh, you're nearly there. You can see the light getting up, getting up. What are the chances of that egg yolk, wherever it is in, this, in the vast ocean, him coming right through it? As the Buddha said, that's how precious and rare this human rebirth is with leisure and fortune. So Shantideva, engaging in the Bodhisattva deed, said, for this, these reasons, the Buddha has said, where there is a yoke adrift in a vast ocean, just as for a turtle to insert its neck into that, it is extremely hard to attain the human state. So as we said that there are 7.75 billion people in this world, there are many that spend a lot of their time elsewhere and some live in war and famine and can't, cannot get anywhere near any sorts of spiritual development. And there's, there's a model called Maslow's Hierarchy of Needs. It's often taught in a lot of businesses, schools, and it just Maslow originally developed this model, which was a spiritual model. And the model says, it says, where is your focus where are your needs? And as we grow up, our physical needs are important, particularly if, if you get breaking out into the world, you've got to have safety. And people who live in war, war zones are just 100% focused on safety. That's their primary reason they've got to live. In Australia, we're safe, most of, you know, generally quite safe. So the next way that we can, what we look for is are things like a home, 
we're safe. We know that there's all these rules and regulations in terms of buying and, and bidding and we want to buy and we get a loan with the buyer. So we have this home, a structure that we stay. Once we buy a house or some place where we can stay, then that's out the way. That's, so we're not worried about safety anymore. We're not worried about getting a home. That's fine. The next thing that you're worried about is establishing yourself in a community. We all need friends. We're, we're, social, we're social animals. So we need to interact. So that, then your thoughts or your motivation is driven on making friends, establishing yourself in a community and so forth. Once you've got your circle of friends, then you focus on the next thing, being esteemed by others. Does that sound familiar? Gee, you're good at what you're doing. Wow, you know, and, and when you're esteemed by others, then bang, you go to get a promotion. So if your motivation's around, well, I want to be promoted, I want to develop, you know, um, more friends and so forth, not Facebook friends, real friends that you can rely on. And once you've established that, then oh, you can relax. You've got it. They say some of the, the most progressive organizations are with chief executive officers who have really attained everything in their lives. So they're now exploring something quite different. So as with you, if you've don't have, if you're safe, if you've got a place to live, you, you've got a community of friends, and you may have large families, that you've achieved what you want to achieve, then Maslow is saying, now I can actually explore areas that I've never really explored in spirituality. That's exactly what the Buddha's, Buddha's understood as well in his teachings that there are reasons, causes, results. But what he's attempting to do is to break through that, to walk, drive past all that, to see that what you're looking for, what you're try searching for, what you're wanting, what you don't want to want, you push, you have aversion, you have attraction, desire, is actually not going to, in the end result, make you happy. Because the more you run to desirous things, the more you want happiness, you're running towards unhappiness. So by establishing ourselves as adults, that what we need, what we have, we can retain, but do it in such a, a beautiful, virtuous way then enlightenment is possible because on the top of this pyramid of Maslow's hierarchy of needs is called self-actualization. And self-actualization in the Dharma teachings is either att attaining liberation or attaining Buddhahood. So that is being brought into this precious human rebirth with leisure and fortune right now. You don't have to study Maslow's hierarchy of needs and go through one step. One, you can break through and see that now. This is the message. You can enjoy the things that you have. It's just the way that we enjoy them. And another way is by extending a little bit out and beyond ourselves to look when we study the first noble truth of suffering, true suffering and true causes, is that you may be the type of person that has capacity to say, okay, I think I can help people. Those who are in their jobs right now helping others in some form through education, through health, through just even listening, might be a little bit inclined to see the benefits of this. So bodhicitta comes up a lot in the Buddhist teachings and Venerable Anna Goldstein is going to focus on that on term four. But just a little bit of a drop of nourishment of what bodhicitta is. Bodhicitta is a ch complete change of state of being. 
something shifts within you and you've got it. And what that what causes that shift is to look at suffering very closely but not get stuck in empathetic distress like we talked about last week. It's understanding like the suffering. Really see it, feel it, know it, that it goes on around. But at the same time, bring the second noble truth in of the causes. And by engaging in that, in an analytical way of meditating or otherwise, just studying it, learning, it can produce an experience, a shift, that just sometimes is unexplainable, not even explainable in human terms. You just change. So what you're doing is wanting to help others and thinking of others. It's, so it's no longer the self-cherishing part. Yeah, there'll be times when we have to eat, we have to think of ourselves, we have to make sure that we're safe around the roads and so forth. But predominantly, every action, every thought is now somewhat wider. So you don't lose your concentration on the detail, but your awareness of others, even simply by entering a room, you're aware of people. So your eye vision may change. What you hear may change. But it's not so much the external things. It is the internal motivation and the internal energy inside that shifts. And you want to help people. So... The next step, do I do it with my physical presence now, like serving people thousands and thousands and thousands of plates of soup? Or do I look at developing myself, how I can become a Buddha and help people? And we're going to briefly look at the time, we're going to quickly go through what a Buddha is and then go into the meditation because without that awareness of that Buddha and, and also the refuge, then the meditation won't make sense. So you may pick up a book like this and say, I'm going to do it. It's not going to be easy in all the quadrants, but it's possible. And this is why most Buddhists appreciate a human rebirth of leisure and fortune because they can continue in, in that life, again, developing their dharma and becoming a Buddha. So in terms of bodhicitta, it's such a powerful, powerful energy to have inside and state of mind. They said that other, all other virtues are like plaintive trees for after bearing the fruit, they simply perish. But the perennial tree of the bodhicitta bears fruit unceasingly and flourishes from that time forth, whether asleep or unconcerned, a force of merit, vast and uneasy, equal to the sky, will be produced. So before we do the meditation, there's a, a few things. To, there's this, the thing called um, taking refuge. Taking refuge by just saying it. It, it's, it doesn't mean anything, but taking refuge simply means finding a safe, a, taking a safe and sound direction in life, because it's not supplicating, it's not bowing to, it's just saying, I understand this now. And it could be replicated in any religious denominations, but in the Buddha Dharma, it says, I understand, I take refuge in the Buddha now that I've studied and analysed what he can do. She, what, and I'm apologies, she, her, or whatever um, gender they are. But that this will just talk for the for the benefit of this lecture as a he. So he he can do so many things for human beings that it's beyond our human consciousness. So we take refuge in the second, the third and fourth noble truth. So we don't take refuge specifically in 
first, second, and third, and fourth noble truths, we take refuge in what the teachings are in the third and fourth noble truth. That is, the true cessation and the true path to cessation. So it's like saying we are training on the teachings that will liberate us and make us into Buddhas. So taking refuge is important. And the Sangha in terms of taking refuge is not the Sangha as in the normal community of monks and nuns and so forth. A Sangha is the Arya Sangha where the, the people in the community, and you don't have to be a nun or a, or a monk, it can be a lay person, has attained the first direct perception of emptiness. Now we'll park that somewhere, but they have, they have div, discovered selflessness. And therefore, what they teach is different. It's just a different quality of their teaching. They're coming from their experience. It doesn't mean that people who are hearers are not able to teach, but it's, they're coming from their depths of experiences. So when we take refuge in the Buddha, we take refuge in the Buddha, in the Buddha that um, understands the type of of ways that he can help all sentient beings. And this is from a, an oral explanation. But the holy body of a Buddha can simultaneously manifest countless different forms in all various realms or universes. Each manifestation is in appropriate ways to help sentient beings according to their needs. The Buddha's holy speech can answer the specific questions of countless people with a single word. The Buddha's speech is heard by each person in his own language and dialect. The Buddha, without any trace of effort, naturally extends his speech, the sound of the Dharma, to all living beings constantly. The Buddha's holy mind is omniscient. It can simultaneously perceive past, present, and future, the delusion and personalities of each living being and on all elements of existence. The Buddha effortlessly appears to living beings according to their needs and faith. The Buddha's actions of teaching the Dharma eliminates the suffering of all and is the cause for positive thoughts wisdom, realizations, and happiness. The Buddha not only teaches through speech, but also by his actions manifesting various forms and displaying gestures indicating particular meanings. It is a function of the Buddha's mind to help eliminate the delusions and dissatisfactions of living beings. It's said that Sometimes you, you can hear the Buddha's teachings just flowing gently through the leaves of a tree. Such is the Buddha's teachings and the drum of the Dharma that continues on all the time. We may not have the karma to hear it. But in stillness, we develop that karma. So the Buddha has four bodies, the nature body, which is a complete enjoyment body and to occur spontaneously without effort and has the omniscient mind. The thing which we're going to discuss is the emanation body, which is the one that forms, that, that comes in the human form. A lot of teachers come in human form, so humans can interact with humans. So they can come and we understand an emanation of a human being because they have the same faculties as us and they're living in the same world as us. But Buddhas can manifest many, many um, emanations out in different forms to suit the practitioner and to suit the state of mind of that practitioner. It's mind-boggling to, to extreme when you think of it. And just by preparing these notes, that um, a few verses came to mind, but the one that really stood out was that 
in terms of the Buddha's emanations and their teachings, which continue all the time, that attempting this drum of tempting of teaching and permeating our consciousness. And when we apply the Dharma and study, some students say they've just got this, this like intuition talking to them. They just, oh, they find out more. They read something and they see something new in it. I not, don't have clairvoyancy, so I don't know where that's coming from, but my best guess is that it's, it's all that continuous production and building up of this motivation, teachings of the Buddha coming together. Sometimes students say that they're walking on the road and they may not be in a, in a happy state and just this person they've never seen before smiles at them. And there's something about that person, that smile, just changes them and sometimes they just may hear a word advice that takes them out of their sad state so these emanations of Buddhas are just indescribable in so the verse in question was, for the benefit of sentient beings, the Buddhas take the form of Indra and Brahma. For some, the form is that of demons. The worldly cannot comprehend this. So emanations can also appear in forms that really push you to the limit or with the skillful means of a Buddha drop something and do something yourself. So an example would be if somebody is such such a, a deterrent in, in wanting to give a person help and that is annoying you in some way, if that person refuses, refuses to help, that you see non-virtuous behaviour, but that sight of non-virtuous behaviour might be the very thing that triggers you to say, no, I'll do it, I'll help them. I'm going to generate this, I'm going to get trained, I'm going to help these people. So they're the mysteries. Well, in Buddhism there's no real mysteries, but in the sense of little things like that where Buddhists may manifest in ways that are manifesting in demons or things that irritate you that might push you a little bit further to develop. or it might be a nagging partner. And I'm just joking here, where you just develop patience, 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 or you learn to make cups of tea for them. So you're actually helping. But Buddhas, and this is very interesting before we do the meditation, that the Buddhas can also manifest as artisan emanation bodies, uh, where the Buddhas manifest as musicians, artists, or craftsmen. That's an interesting concept, isn't it? Makes you want to think also the, the movies that are created or the artwork or the beautiful music that you hear that can calm millions of people. And music, for example, is the very thing that can actually create, bring people together. And you've seen those concerts where, um, where the performer often says, they and everyone listening are one beyond the X factor. They are just one. And people feel lifted sometimes. That's potentially the beautiful part of music. Just feel happy at times. But more importantly, part of the community. So the Dharma, as we say, we are actually, when we say refuge to the Dharma, we're saying to the true path and the true sensation. When we say we have refuge in the Sangha, we're saying for the actual ultimate Sangha, it's the same thing as the ultimate Dharma. It's the Arya's knowledge and liberation. In other words, their paths and their true cessation. So we're taking refuge 
in the teachings. When we refer to Sangha. So when we do take refuge, if, if in fact that is what you wish to do, negative, um, a lot of negative delusions are purified and negative or potential karma ripening is reduced. You accumulate extensive merit very quickly. And you become a Buddhist, but not necessarily by the census, like marking yourself down. It is also the basis of all ordinations and empowerments. So without having taken refuge, you cannot receive any vows of ordination or Vajrayana empowerments. Now we'll touch on what Vajrayana is a little bit later. So if the merit from taking refuge had form, the three realms would be too small to accommodate it. The great ocean, the source of all water, cannot be measured with a cup. So with that, having gone through understanding how precious this human rebirth has, is and what the three refuges are, the Buddha, the Dharma and the Sangha, Buddha meaning in his qualities, the Dharma meaning in the teachings, the actual pure teachings of cessation and path to cessation and and Sangha meaning, um, so the Buddha Dharma and the Sangha meaning not just the, the physical human forms, but the actual holders of those truths. We're now going to do the meditation. But a bit of um, advice beforehand, we've still got time, that last week we spoke about subject object. And in this meditation, we're going to use the terminology subject, which is you, the object is what you see, can be uh, by sight or the object of what you're feeling inside. Concentration that we're doing is still in the mind, so we're, we're gathering energy. The body becomes pliant. We're using analytical and single point of concentration. And those two, again, analyticals used to understand and learn, which then moves to an experience. If you have an experience whilst you're meditating, be careful not to tighten the body, to, to grip, because our human conditioning and our aggregates and all our thoughts, our consciousness, sometimes is not able to hold what you're experiencing, so it kind of like contracts a bit. Or you or you're trying to label it. Oh, this is what they mean. This is what they mean. Just let it flow. Anyone that's done martial arts or a little bit of tai chi or any yoga will know that there's a flow to things. If you have that experience, just let it be. And you may wish to point single point at concentration on just being with it. Because the moment you try and hold on to it is the moment when it goes. Jim Carrey had an experience where he said he, he saw like all the universe together and he's done YouTube lectures about it and so forth. He's now ever chasing it. And that's the wrong type of possibly the wrong way of chasing that experience. Um, I'm not sure what he's doing now, but that's how it can. You just want to you know, you go back to your meditation so you can have that experience again. Just be natural. Sometimes those experiences are like a, a flash of light to teach you, what you what's within you. We're going to talk about um, field of merit, and what that is is given that we've been reborn many times, we've had teachers and gurus, dharma protectors and guardians, so we're just visualising them in, in our meditation. And we're going to do the four immeasurables. And the four immeasurables, are what well, it is a Mahayana practice where you're looking 
and saying prayers and wishes for all sentient beings. And that is very, very strong, positive way to develop uh, more virtues in your life. So are you ready for this final meditation? In now. So if you find yourself in a, a very comfortable position, does anyone have any questions at this stage? No? Nope. All right. So find yourself in a comfortable position. And we start by the motivation of why we're doing this. Moment by moment, life is uncertain. We see lots of suffering in this world, both in our own suffering and the witness of suffering. Through the simple act of meditating, we wish to add to this world more happiness. And we will generate a virtuous mind to ensure that we add further happiness. And in doing so, progress on the spiritual path to be the maximum benefit to self and others. May we be blessed to continue this practice. So now, bringing the mind to the breath again, relaxing the body and stilling the mind. Visualize in space before you at about the level of the forehead. Not too high and not too low. A precious throne in the nature of light supported by eight mighty lions. On top of the throne is a light natured lotus flower with petals of various colours. On top of the lotus is a disc-like moon cushion and on top of the moon is a disc-like sun cushion. Both are in the nature of light. Sitting on these is our kind root guru in this or previous lives, taking the aspect of Shakyamuni Buddha. His body is golden coloured in the nature of light. His right hand rests on his right knee in the earth touching gesture. His left hand rests in his lap in the gesture of meditative equipoise and holds a begging bowl filled with nectar. He is wearing the saffron coloured robes of a monk and has all the marks of a perfect enlightened Buddha. His body composed of light is clear and translucent. He sits in the Vajra position and emanates countless rays of light in all directions. At his heart is a small lotus 
with the sun disk on top. Seated on these is Conqueror Vajradhara, the primordial Buddha, the holder of the Tantras, with a deep blue coloured body in the nature of light. He sits in the Vajra position and has one face and two arms. Guru Shakyamuni Buddha is surrounded by your direct and lineage gurus and your personal meditation deities, Buddhas, Bodhisattvas, Dharma heroes, Dakinis and Dharma protectors. In front of each of these holy beings, visualize their teachings of scriptures in the nature of light resting on tables. The holy beings of this field of merit look favorably on us and are smiling gently by reflecting on their qualities and kindness, generate strong faith. And for those that wish, even in a future life, to recite the refuge. I go for refuge to the Guru. I go for refuge to the Buddha. I go for refuge to the Dharma. I go for refuge to the Sangha. And in Sanskrit, Namu Gurai Baya, Namu Buddhaya, Namu Dhammaya. Namo Sangaya. Same time, visualize that other beings surrounding you are reciting together. Namo Guru Baya. Namo Buddhaya. Namo Dhammaya. Namo Sangaya. I go for refuge to the Guru the Buddha, the Dharma and the Sangha. So holding the single pointed concentration in our bodies and with analytical meditation in the stillness of mind and calmness Clarity. Imagine all sentient beings around you as far as your imagination can go, perhaps just in front, but others to the left, right, behind, below, or above. Allow your intuition. Allow your own mind to imagine being surrounded by sentient beings, humans, non-humans. And together we all say, I prostrate my three doors with a mind of respect and offer all actually arranged and mentally emanated offerings. I reveal all the downfalls and negativities that I have ever collected and rejoice in the virtues of individuals and superiors. 
for the Buddhas, Bodhisattvas, the Dharma protectors and guardians, please remain perfectly abiding until samsara is no longer seen. I request you to turn the vast and profound wheels of Dharma. I dedicate the virtues of myself and others to the great enlightenment. And while still holding the single point of concentration, now visualize nectar and five different colored lights, white, red, blue, orange, and green, descend from the heart of the Buddha and of the direct and lineage gurus and dissolving into the bodies and minds of yourself and all living beings. So imagine that nectar of light, white, red, blue, orange, green, moving like waves or direct into you and all sentient beings. Just imagine the colours within you and others. Everyone, all sentient beings, and you are one. Such powerful blessings, that light, colours and purity moving through, blending, mending, connecting, All that with single point of concentration and experience. Feel the nectar flowing warm. And enters the hearts bodies of all sentient beings and the light purifies all negativities created during limitless lifetimes. All these negativities are purified. All these negativities are purified. So you visualize them as the soot and black liquid are washed out of our body completely and disappear as darkness illuminated by light. Now the blessings of the Buddhas and Gurus are received. Your lifespan merit and realizations increase. Body and mind are completely purified and transformed into the nature of light. Just be present in that nature of light. Feel it, know it.
in the light. A duplicate of Buddha emanates and dissolves into you. Feel that you become in oneness, the Buddha's body, speech and mind. Concentrate single pointedly on this just for a moment. And now that Shakyamuni Buddha has entered your heart. Lights from your body reaching out to all living beings, completely purifying all their negativities and eliminating their suffering. Visualize that they too transform into Shakyamuni Buddhas. You should think that now you have achieved your goal for Bodhicitta. And with Shakyamuni Buddha in your heart and your body, generate love, compassion, joy, equanimity. With immeasurable love, may all living beings have happiness and all causes of happiness. Immeasurable compassion, may all living beings be free from suffering and all causes of suffering. Immeasurable joy, May all living beings never be separated from joy. Immeasurable equanimity. May all living beings abide in equanimity, free of attachment to some and aversion to others. So we now dedicate the merit. Of this meditation myself and all sentient beings may we quickly, quickly attain enlightenment and still be present within the light, the peace, the brilliance, the knowing. strength, the resilience, the conviction that you can. Feel the light clearing your hearing, your sight, your speech, your actions, your tastes. And now gently bring in that visualization all of it, all of it to you, to you. So bring your mind to the breath. To the seat or the cushion you're standing or sitting. in this temple. To any sounds you hear outside. So when you're ready, you may gently open your eyes.
Does anyone have any questions or even online? Money will give me the go ahead as to whether there are any questions, so we'll just wait for a moment. Wait for the vegan cake that's awaiting. Who baked the vegan cake? Oh, well done. And the tea and coffee. We good? Next week we'll be doing Aspiring to Liberation and talking about suffering and delusions and the true source. And uh, that's going to be a, a little bit um, meaty, but we'll make it as light as we possibly can. And finally, the week four will be 12 links. That is really interesting. That that's, shows how we are kind of constructed how we happen so we can unravel ourselves and then the path to liberation as well how it gets there so we're done yep it's a wrap everyone hope you have a great wonderful week may you be blessed with much peace and harmony may you achieve your goals and be of benefit to others thank you Hello, everybody. Hello, everybody. Hello, everybody.